I'd like to highlight. If you want to know what um, the New Testament understands by fruit, not the psalm, then uh, have a, get your concordance and look up fruit. Um, and you'll find that Paul uses it in a surprising way. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit. What's the water that irrigates us? The through the Word. No, it comes through the Word is the Spirit coming through the Word. And what is the fruit of the Spirit? Notice singular, strangely, love, joy, peace, patience. In Philippians 1, Paul talks about the fruit of righteousness, and that's giving praise and glory to God, etc. Um, uh, uh, then in Romans 6, Paul talks about the fruit of holiness, which is eternal life, and so on. Okay? Um, now, there's a whole number of passages which don't quote this directly or don't uh, and allude to it only marginally, but you can see the influence of this and similar passages from the Old Testament which are applied in a very specific sense in the New Covenant. And uh, if you look at all of them, uh, none of them lead down the road of the prosperity gospel. Now one last question that I'd like you to consider. A uh, bigger picture now. Why is it that this psalm has been placed here, it, and I think it was composed quite deliberately by the editors or editor or a editor of the Psalter? Why is this placed as an introduction to the Psalter? Isn't it saying to meditate on the, the word of God? That's where we uh, okay. meditated and received. Okay. Uh, uh, but why then? That's true. But why as an introduction to the Psalter? You're halfway there. Now get, you know, think more accurately. Why did the editors of the Psalter put this psalm here at the head of the Psalter to help people who were going to use this book. Yes, Stephen? Did you say something? No. No? Brooks? Brooke? Um, because we always read the first one, the uh, first one and the last one, so it would be That's just yeah, it's, but, that's, but that doesn't say why this psalm. It could have been any other psalm. What about this psalm? Say it out loud. It tells you what to do with the rest of it, to meditate on it. Okay, it tells you how to use the rest of the Psalter. Now, there's two sides to it. Um, what this psalm says is that what follows, all the other psalms come out of what situation? The situation of a person or people who do what? Meditate, meditate on the Torah of God day and night regularly in prosperity and adversity um, they meditate on the Torah of God not just by praising God but also by lamenting and praying and teaching and etc. So it uh, shows it, it tells us something about the origin of the Psalter but more importantly it tells the reader how to use the Psalter to do what? To meditate on the Torah of God. Now the Torah of God, remember we spoke about the Psalms, there's two things here um, and you get a combination here, you have the person who reads the Psalter is to meditate on the Torah of God in two senses. One is the Word of God, the teaching of God, as is found in the Old Testament, but also God's guidance. Where and how? It's in the experiences of life. So how do you, how do you come to be guided by God? It's by using both ears to listen to God and by using your eyes to see what God is 
doing in your life. Um, now, usually people see God's guidance on, uh, only under, with certain events. The modern fashion is to see God at work in miraculous interventions. Huh? Change from bad to good. Sorry? When things change from bad to good. You know. Yeah, that's where you see God at work. Is God at work in miraculous interventions? Yeah, of course he is. But what's the problem? Is God at work only in miraculous interventions? God is at work... In the bad times. In what part of a person's journey? Every single step of the journey, God is at work Torahing people, teaching them, teaching them through his word, through their experience in the school of life. And the two interact with each other. In fact, God's guidance, God's direction is uh, are not seen most clearly in miraculous interventions like the deliverance at the Red Sea or crossing the Jordan <coughs> or those spectacular events. They're very rare in people's lives. And many of you will, the whole life, have none. And you'll be blessed if you don't have a miraculous intervention. Because what's God's normal way of doing? It's walk, walk with you in the ordinary every day. Um, which is between disaster and miracle. Okay? But in fact, you will see God's uh, guidance working most clearly, not in the miracles, but in the disasters, troubles. Um, uh, and So, from a New Testament point of view, the way of the righteous is the way of the Lord. Now, have you noted how, what an important metaphor that is for the Gospels, particularly Mark's Gospel? is built around that picture of the way of the Lord. What is the way of the Lord according to Matthew, Mark and Luke, but particularly Mark? Is that way that leads how? So there's a miracle at the end, which is the resurrection. It's the way of the cross. Um, taking up the cross following me. So the way of discipleship is the way of the cross, the way that leads through death to life um, uh, with God. Any uh, further ideas or questions before we move to the second psalm, which is also an introductory psalm? Okay. Now, um, you no doubt found, those of you who work closely through this, let's see where have I got the least to expunge. Those of you who work through the psalm know, have, uh, have noted that the Hebrew here is a little bit difficult. Now, the reason it's difficult is that it's very old Hebrew. If I was just an ordinary historical scholar, I would uh, spend a great deal of time just looking at the uh, linguistic minutiae here to demonstrate certain features. But one... Um, uh, uh, feature here that you may not be familiar with is this ending the Amo ending which is Old Hebrew for uh, that so them plural a plural noun with the them or their at the ending, their ropes is not a hem but a mo. Uh, now that's very old Hebrew. Um, scholars argue a bit exactly as to when you had the shift from this ending to that ending um, and why there was this linguistic shift. It's a bit like the shift from uh, 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 thee and thy to you in English. Right? You get these linguistic shifts that occur and what happens then is that they don't occur at any one time. It's a gradual shift over a space and it starts somewhere until it becomes common usage and then there's a while in which you get both of these together 
And you can find some old psalms where both of those together, uh, you some, some psalms where that occurs, and sometimes then too you get archaic survivals. Like you get the black hymn book there now which um, uh, uses what for modern Australian English is archaic um, use of say thee and thy and thine. So that's an interesting feature. Now, I say that because uh, of what follows. This begins with the lama, which is the signal that this is a, a lament. Why? For what reason? Lama ragashu goyim. Why do the nations uh, rage or act in an unsettled way? U le umim and the peoples yechku rik. And why do the peoples <coughs> meditate emptiness, illusion, delusion? Now you get a contrast with the first psalm, talks about one kind of meditation, which is meditation on God's Torah, and now you get a different kind of meditation. The godless nations meditate like the uh, righteous, but they meditate on reek, emptiness, vanity, delusion, illusion. Lama carried over. Lama yatsevu malchei eretz, malchei eretz. And why do the kings of the earth, eretz, conspire together? No, this is a hithpael. They conspire together. Verotsenim and the princelings, the princes, the rulers, no sedu yachtau, take counsel together. Um, now you get a break here in the line, which is emphatic, a half verse. Al adanai, against the Lord, ve al mashicho, mashicho against the Lord and his anointed one, or his anointed king. Net na techwa, let us, so you go from, uh, uh, to direct speech, this is what they say to each other, this is their decision. Let us break, eth mozero themo, notice that themo, which is this, let us break their chains, their fetters, apart. Venashlicha, um, notice it's cohortative, and let us cast off mimenu from us, o avothemo, their ropes. Now, who's speaking here at this stage? It's somebody speaking, an official in a court, probably court prophet, Reporting what the kings say. Yoshev Bashamayim Yeshach. The one enthroned, the one seated on the heavens or over the heavens, laughs. Um, laughs. Adonai, my lord. And it has that uh, plural ending there to indicate that it's Lord with a capital L. It's not a human Lord, but it's the Lord God. Other nigh, my Lord, capital letters. Um, Yelag lamo. You get that amo ending again? Amo, amo. Um, uh, <coughs> my Lord mo mocks at them, scoffs at them, or la, I know, makes fun of them. Um, Az yedaver elemo. Notice that amo ending again. Beafo. Um, now, or here and now, he speaks to them in his af. Now, uh, literally, af is nose, nostrils. It's it's a dual form. You have af is one nostril. It's usually dual form nostrils. Now. Um, this demonstrates a very interesting feature of Hebrew. Uh, there's very few abstract nouns. Um, most human emotions 
are not used uh, uh, and uh, described abstractly but concretely in connection with the part of the body that they are manifested in. And so, um, what, how do you know that somebody is angry? Their nostrils flare and they go red, they go heated and the face goes red. So heat and nostrils are terms for anger. And anger in the sense not of hidden anger, but of temper, expressed anger. Um, right, see the way it goes? Um, so, um, he speaks to them in his wrath. U uh, no, and in his heat, in his indignation, um, he uh, uh, confounds them, he uh, dismays them. Now you get, uh, how does God do this? Above, this is God's word. Va'ani nasachti, I myself, notice the emphatic ani there, I myself have installed Malhi, my king, Al Zion, on Zion, that's the holy mountain where the temple and the palace was in Jerusalem, Har Kodshi, literally the mountain of my holiness, the mountain of my sanctuary, usually translated the holy mountain. But notice it's not the adjective, it's an, uh, a noun here. It's the mountain of my sanctuary, my holy place. Uh, why is it the holy mountain? It's because it has the sanctuary of God, the temple of God on it. So God installs his king on his mountain sanctuary. Then you get a change of speaker and you get the king speaking. Uh, let me tell concerning or about, let me speak about the decree hok, of the Lord Adonai. Now, hok is an interesting word. All words are interesting. Um, hok comes from hakwak, which means to carve. First of all, it means to carve in stone. And then it means to cast in metal. And from that you get a number of nouns, but the one we have here is the thing that is carved in stone or written in stone that's cast in metal is the hoke, the decree. Now, what's the difference between a order, a decree, or pronouncement, and you notice here that is, is, it's a pronouncement that's uh, carved in stone and that's uh, 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 written on a slate. That was a normal writing material, a slate. Not papyrus, not um, even uh, vellum. Okay, so if you write on slate, something on slate, it's temporary. It's temporary, but if it's carved in stone, it's set in cement. Right? So uh, uh, this is a very strong uh, decree, um, a perpetual decree. Um, let me tell you concerning the decree or the pronouncement of the Lord. And the, here you get it. Ama Eli, he said to me, this is the decree, Beni Atta, you are my son, Ani, emphatic, I myself, and more emphatic, Hayom, uh, it is on this day that I myself, today I myself, Yel Yelith Techa, I myself have begotten you. Yalav uh, is the first stage of the birth process. Um, it's the male side of the birth process. Uh, sexual intercourse, not sexual intercourse, but where you get the moment of conception, but not from the female point of view, but from the male point of view. So, uh, beget. Um, uh, 
Uh, sometimes people translate given birth to, it's not that, it's the beginning of that uh, process. Sometimes it can be the whole process, but from the male point of view. Today I have, um, I don't know, there's no one English word except uh, the old word beget. <coughs> Today I have conceived you, that's a female way of putting it, there's no word there in modern English. Today I have, um, sorry? Has and that's pretty good. Fathered in that sense of con and, uh, bringing. Father, not in the sense of looking after as a father, but fathering. That's the closest you can get to it, I think. Today I have fathered you. That's quite good. She'al um, mimeni, ask of me, make a request of me. There, um, notice the simple wow here. Imperative, simple wow, cohortative, which indicates purpose. Ask of me so that I may give goyim, the nations, nachalatecha, as your inheritance, as your hereditary domain. So if I'm a farmer, my inheritance is the farm. So the nations as the king's inheritance, his hereditary domain. Uh, where am I? Va ahu sa techa, and your as your possession, the ends of the earth. So ask, so make a request, so that I may give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. Okay, what's the picture here? God is offering the king... What? No. The whole world as his kingdom. The ends of the earth means it's all the nations, the non-Jewish nations, Goyim, uh, and the ends of the earth, the whole world as his kingdom. Um Tiro Maim Vesheveth Batsal um uh may oh, you will uh smash them um or shepherd them, there's those two possibilities with an iron rod and like the vessel of a potter, like a piece of pottery you will smash them. Now it sounds rather gruesome. It's not as gruesome as it sounds. It's conventional image, imagery. Now that's the end of the decree of God. Now um, notice it's, it's uh, um, a declaration. You are my son, today I have fathered you. And then there is a command to make a request. And then there is the task that God gives to the king um, as his king. So three parts to it. Now in the light of the above, now you go back to the court prophet, the psalmist, in verse 10, Va'atam melachim hishlechu. And now, you kings, be sensible. Um, take instruction. Here, u sedu. Yassa is to teach, instruct. It can also be discipline. Now, this is the Ahithpael, receive instruction, receive teaching, receive discipline. Shofate Aretz, you judges of the earth. Now, what is the uh, instruction that's being given here? There are three imperatives. Ivadu eth Adonai. Serve or worship the Lord with, trem uh, with fearfulness. Vegilu beraatha. Yeah, I've got it right. And rejoice with trembling. The third imperative. Nashechuba, kiss the sun. Notice the, the PL there, intensive. Fen, 
Ja af, a, 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 je a naf. From af, lest he be angry, angry, vetove thu deri. And you perish with respect to the way. Notice the way perishing there. Um, wrath, wrath. Um, why? Ki yeva, uh, uh, ki kimat. For in a little while, or in a little way, he is angry, uh, his wrath is kindled. So his wrath is kindled for a little while or to a little degree. Um, Ashare kol hose vo. Happy, blessed are all those who take refuge in him. Okay, this is going to be very important. Notice here two emphatic half verses, this and this. Translation. Now the situation for this psalm is a king has died um, and there's an interim period that's taken place. There's always some <coughs> instability after the death of the king. What's the problems? The question is who is going to be this? Yes. Who's going to watch over the kingdom in the interim? Uh, who's going to be the next king? There's jostling in the court, there's jostling in the kingdom. And then what do the, your enemies do and the people who are your vassals do in this interim? There's internal fighting and there's eternal attacks. You try and um, uh, break away from the kingdom since the king is now dead. It's a weak position. Um, so that's basically the situation. Why do the nations rage and the peoples meditate on emptiness? Why do the kings of the earth take their stand or conspire together? And the princes conspire or assemble together against Yahweh and his anointed one. Now what's the surprise here? This. Okay. And what's their basic plan? Let us break their fetters. Who is fetter? Their fetters? The fetters of God and his king. Right? The fetters that God and the king has placed on them and throw off their, uh, let's break their chains, let's throw off their fetters, their ropes. The one enthroned in the heaven laugh, Yahweh pokes fun at them. This is what he says to them in his wrath, little wrath, so that he frightens them in his anger. He gives them a fright in his anger. Now, and it's a funny response in his wrath. Now, I'd expect, I'm going to zap you so-and-sos. What does he do? He's angry. I have, what's his angry speech? I have installed my king on Zion, the mountain of my sanctuary. What? Like a father with a child, they give them a little, sometimes you can give them a little fright to get their attention. Yeah. So it's angry speech, but the, what's funny is that the content of the speech is not angry. Funny stuff. Um, and yet there's something very profound. Notice the, notice the juxtaposition here, which doesn't, you know, it's most surprising. There's a, 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 a disparity between the emotion, the manner of speech, and the content of the speech. Um, now, um, that's spoken about the king and about the Lord. Now you get the king speaking here. Um, let me tell of the decree, the commission of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I become your father. I should have an R there for you Ask of me so that I may give you the nations as your heritage and the ends of the earth as your property, your possession. You will smash them, or may you smash them with an iron scepter and um, crush them with an iron scepter and smash them like a piece of pottery. Therefore, now what's the therefore? Because God has given this 
commission and has installed his king on Zion. Therefore, what's the sensible course of action for the kings of the earth? This is what they are to do. Therefore, your kings, you kings, be sensible. Take advice, you judges of the earth. Um, now, what I would expect, you know, make a treaty, end your rebellion against Israel. But what? Serve the Lord. Serve the Lord. And that is a double sense, serve the Lord as, your, as the king, but also serve the Lord by worshipping him. Mm. Serve the Lord uh, with reverence. And rejoice, this is a surprise, instead of being sorry, being sad, rejoice, but rejoice with trembling. What kind of trembling? Not stated. Very puzzling. Kiss the sun lest he be angry and you perish in your way, for his wrath can kindle quickly or in a short space of time or for a little while or to a little degree. All sorts of possibilities. Um, happy are all those who take refuge in him. Now, who is the son that they are to kiss? The anointed Messiah, God's son. Um, uh, notice the first two imperatives focus on God. The third imperative focuses on God's Messiah. And then one last thing before we uh, uh, end today's lesson. Um, now, um, happy are all those who take refuge in him. The crux here is who is the him? Now, if you normally follow the usage in the Psalms, taking refuge, who do you normally take refuge in? God. But grammatically speaking, who's the nearest antecedent here to him? Sons. The son. Astonishing. Take refuge in the king. Funny advice given to people who rebel against the king. That they are to take refuge in the king. And <coughs> taking refuge in the king means taking also refuge in God. Uh, very, very profound stuff going on here. Have a break. No, I have a break. That's the end of the list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.